Welcome back, Wanderers, to another episode of the Corner of Story and Game. Today, we're welcoming back the illustrious Eric Scott DeBee, a master of the written word. Eric has graced the podcast not once, but twice before, each time weaving tales that lingered long after the final word was spoken. Eric's creative journey has led him down countless literary paths as a novelist, fiction writer, editor, game designer, and a devoted lifelong gamer. But today, we're going to have him help illuminate the power and allure of short stories. So, Eric, thank you for joining me. Of course. I love being on your show. You always ask great questions and the conversations are great. So, yeah, I appreciate that, man. And you're my only three time person. So, must be be a hand trick. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, today I want to sit down and chat with you about short stories. Short fiction is an extremely interesting form of writing. Some people look at it and go, that must be easy. And in fact, shorts are quite often much, much harder because you have to condense. But we'll get into that. But before we do, You've been here twice before, so lots of people know who you are, and your work is everywhere. So, people, But just in case, for that one guy who doesn't know, give me a quick, short origin story, how you fell in love with gaming and writing, and the journey to here today. Okay, so I'm a sci-fi fantasy author, all right? Fantasy, superheroes, that's this book right behind me, or sci-fi, all kinds of stuff. And I have wanted to be a writer since grade school, I think, and it mostly emerges out of reading a lot, reading all kinds of classic sci-fi, uh, classic fantasy, contemporous, contemporaneous fantasy, and the all kinds of stuff. Um, when I was in middle school and high school was when the Forgotten Realms were just starting to come out as a, as a thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I loved those books. And my first novel ended up being a tie-in novel in the Forgotten Realms setting, which I wrote my junior and senior year of college. So I've been pretty determined and dedicated to getting this done (laughs) since an early age. And of course, gaming is a major part of it because one of the things that really made me fall in love with particular settings and storytelling was running games in those settings. And in the Forgotten Realms, in Planescape and Ravenloft and Dark Sun, which I'm now revisiting all those novels and thinking of ways to like maybe incorporate it into my streaming. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah. And so it, it's always been just kind of an organic mixture for me, the writing and the gaming, which is a part of why I love this show so much, because I mean, that's kind of yeah. where we go with it. You're the perfect, perfect guinea pig for me to... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm the hat trick. I've been here three times, so <laughs> it works okay, well, um, short stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, but before we dig into the short stories, okay, just to help me set the stage, what shorts have you penned? What anthologies have you contributed to? Where, how, where can we find short fiction by Eric? Uh, the list is pretty <laughs> long. I have written a number of Forgotten Realms short stories. You can find me in... Realms of the Dragons 2, Realms of the Dead, Realms of the Elves. Try and, I think that might be it, just just those three. I have also written stories in Human for a Day, which is about usually items, non, non-living objects that become human for a day, and then what, what would happen? Right. And I wrote mine about a, a sword in ancient, not really Japan, and it was, it's pretty cool. I am in the Shadowed Souls anthology from Jim Butcher and Carrie uh, Hughes, which is massively successful, mostly because it contains a, a Dresden file story mm-hmm. and a whole bunch of other great short stories, which are all kind of this like noirish on the street urban fantasy sort of stuff. Uh, one of the first appearances by my Justice Vengeance characters is in that particular story. So, I recommend seeking that anthology out if you have the time. It is well worth your well worth your investment. And really the best way to find the short stories that I've written would be to go to my bibliography, which I'm sure there will be a link in the doobly-doo below this video. That's right. Or attached to this podcast or however you're consuming this, you (laughs) should be able to find a link. Very cool. There definitely will be. You've written lots of shorts. Sorry. I've lost count of how many. (laughs) <laughs> that was just small sampling. I'm also a regular contributor to the Unmobius universe. I think we talked about this before. Yep, we did. It's kind of a Indiana Jones teams up with James Bond to fight Cthulhu sort of story. 
and I have contributed to a collected novels and also just standalone short stories uh, in that particular universe, which is something that we'll talk about when we talk about short stories specifically. Ooh. Is there different kinds of short stories for different purposes? So mm -hmm. I am really excited. This is cool. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, let's let's start broad. Let's let's start out in the big picture kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In Eric's opinion, in your opinion, mm -hmm. what is it? What is the unique impact that a short story has on a reader as opposed to a longer form of narrative? Well, I think the unique impact that a short story has on a reader is a unique impact. A short story has one major point that it's getting across. One twist, one resolution of the story, one question that gets answered, one cathartic moment. A novel might raise any number of questions, have any number of themes. Lots of different characters want different things, and, and the, the conflict and the tension among all those things is what forms the novel. Short story don't have time for all that. <laughs> Short story is aiming for one point, and you're getting it across in the story. Sometimes... Short stories will talk about other things and they'll raise other questions and other themes. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't or that they can't, mm -hmm. but the fundamental classic basis of a short story is to get across one point, make the reader go at the end of it. Like, I understand. I, I understand what the story was trying to tell me. Or the question I had at the start is now answered. Or, oh, now the the monstrous evil has been revealed and now I could be ooh, creeped out about it. Right. That's what the short story does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously you're talking about brevity. That's what lies at the heart of a good short story. In your experience, in your opinion, how do you go about crafting a story that has been boiled down to such a fine point without sacrificing rich character development, compelling themes, themes I can kind of see based on what you said, but like, you know, when you you work with a longer form fiction, you can you have space to chew the wood, mm -hmm. you know, to, to chew things apart and work on deeper characters. What? How do you do that in a short? It just has to be very efficient, very direct, very clear what's happening. But the pieces. Okay, I was thinking about this a little bit earlier, and I'm trying to work on my metaphor, and I didn't quite get the metaphor together. But let's go with it. Mm -hmm. So, a novel is like a huge jigsaw puzzle with like 8,000 pieces. And you can kind of see the edge, right? The edge is like the table of contents, kind of basically tells you where things are going to start. A short story is a really small jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes the pieces are, are small and difficult to put together, but they always fit together, and you can always get it put together fairly quickly, mm -hmm. right? And so in that case... You need to be you need to be more efficient and tighter with your story, not necessarily with your prose. Your prose can be as tight or as loose as your style demands. But you have to get you have to get a lot of things accomplished in the process of a very short period of time. Short stories, it's not just about word count, it's mostly about keeping everything a singular experience, mm. right? A novel can produce lots of different feelings and at different times it might produce a different feeling. It might produce different thoughts from different chapters. Like if we look at George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire books, you know, they're overall about a couple of common things. Everyone deals with, you know, morality and ethics and the struggle between pragmatism and you know their ideal idealism and their belief in who they are and what should happen right and that's very complicated right because everybody has different different values and different ways of looking at things that's that's epic fantasy in a nutshell but in a short story like one chapter of a martin book could be a short story if it didn't affect anyone else, if it didn't otherwise affect the story, but still replicated some of the basic concepts of the story. Mm -hmm. Certain of his prologues kind of sound like short stories when they're about a character you've never met before 
who is undertaking a particular task and they usually fail and die terribly. <laughs> like the prologue to the first book, Game of Thrones, could be a short story. If you just read that prologue itself, and it leaves you with this kind of existential cosmic dread feeling at the end. Like, oh no, there's this kingdom and they're going to be overrun by, by whites and it's going to be terrible. Okay, that's it. There's no more <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire. It was just this moment. So that's what a short story is. Right. It, it isn't necessarily leading to anything else. And it isn't necessarily built upon anything else. It could happen in the same setting and it could be dealing with familiar themes. Jim Butcher's Dresden short stories are a very good example of that sort of thing. Like, obviously, there's an ongoing story with Dresden where he's going novel to novel to novel to novel, which sometimes take place, you know, months apart, sometimes like a year or two apart. Mm -hmm. But the short stories are picking up on that same, that same setting with the same feel and then they're they're grinding down to like a very specific sort of like, here's the case that I have to solve. And here's this one weird thing in my setting. Like, mm -hmm. or here's this one curse that happened to be placed upon people and I'm going to break it. That kind of thing. Gotcha. Um, and obviously, this is me leading to the different kinds of short stories. Because mm -hmm. there are short stories that are totally original that have no other characters no other setting nothing nothing established and then there are the stories that tie into something that you know are forgotten round short stories so you have a setting you might even have familiar characters who show up you know song of ice and fire short stories are like that although i hesitate to call those short stories they're more like novellas <laughs> that martin <laughs> writes while he's waiting for the next great idea to come up for the next book that's been mm -hmm. It's been a while, George. Anyway, um, and Dresden short stories are like that too. But I've I've answered your question in a very rambly way. But when to come back to this concept of how do you develop your characters uh, in a in a tight, moving, good way over a short period of time, you really have to drill down to what you want the character to get across just like what you want the story to get across and then you have every sentence that that character is involved in tying into that leading toward that same point mm -hmm. everything they do should be in the service of developing them as a character showing what their interests are showing what their strengths are showing what their weaknesses are showing their drive toward what the story is trying to get to Wow. So it's cool. just it's it's really just a question of focus. Novels don't need quite as much focus. Novels can be panoramic. Short stories, they're one really good, really keen shot gotcha. of the night sky. The, the, the kind of the reoccurring thing I'm picking up is they they have to be self contained and they have to have a point. Yes. Generally speaking, yes. I, say, I, I always got to say, generally speaking, when we're talking about literature, because there are always exceptions to everything. Um, any art, period. Correct. There's always Correct. Things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, actually, I went to art school, and one of the hardest things you learn when you study painting, especially with oils, is mm -hmm. when is the last stroke? When do you walk away? So, in a short story, how do you know when you hit that moment? How do you know when, okay, this short is done or there's something more that needs to be added or I need to pull back and cut, you know, a hundred words? Like, <laughs> is this a hard one? Oh, well, it's different for everybody, I got to say. Like, it, that's one of those things that you develop over time. You get You get a feel for how you write things. I am what I like to describe as an intuitive writer. And so as I'm writing, I'm kind of the back of my head thinking, Okay, what is the what is the audience thinking here? What do I want them to think? How am I suggesting to them that that's what they should be thinking? And then you ask yourself, what needs to happen to answer the fundamental question of my story? And when that thing happens, story's over. Like there could be a little wrap up, or it could be, you know, the revelation is the very last sentence of the story, and that's it. And you just leave on that extremely punchy moment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come down from the climax. You could just stay there and just end, right? 
and then sometimes that can that can leave the the reader with this uh, it, it can leave more of an impact that way if you don't try and stitch things back up let things break apart and let the reader put them together mm. it sounds almost like short fiction has some similarities when it comes to poetry in that you can experiment with things you don't have to close loops you can use literature to actually create art as opposed to telling a story strictly. Definitely. Definitely. Also, a short story is much less investiture of time for a reader. A little bit for a writer, although <laughs> I every writer is different, right? We have different processes. You know, some short stories I can write in a weekend. Some short stories take me months to write because I'm not entirely sure how to unravel the thing. Mm. But for a reader... It's easier to ask a reader to read a short story than to say, hey, you must read this novel so we can talk about it tomorrow, right? <laughs> it's the, the metaphor, the analogy is a little bit like saying, hey, did you see the new Star Wars movie? That's like a short story. The Star Wars movie is basically a short story <laughs> versus, hey, did you watch all of season one of The Mandalorian? Because <laughs> that is a novel. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And it's there's just a much different expenditure of time and focus. Mandalorian asking all kinds of questions. All kinds of characters are doing different things. One Star Wars novel, it's a bunch of people just <laughs> all in one. I'm clearly talking about the rise of Skywalker, and I and I really shouldn't be. <laughs> Because well, all those all those movies are a little bit messy. It's true, and and that's fine. Like, they're still great. Mm -hmm. I got a little bit off topic there, but the <laughs> the point is the point is short stories are more efficient. They're supposed to be more efficient. They're supposed to have less investiture for a reader, unless they're like again, unless. They might have a really, really heavy emotional component to them. Like, have you ever read a short story where you just, like, you needed to drink afterward, that kind of thing? Like, you feel like, oh, my God, and you're still thinking about it hours later? That's a really good short story. And so I, I hesitate to say that that's less investiture than reading, you know, a fun romp sort of novel. I would agree. Speaking of creative writing classes, I did have mm -hmm. a, an instructor decades ago tell me that when you're crafting short stories, you should always consider the fact that the person's going to possibly be reading these on the bus or in the back of a cab or grabbing pieces here and there. Like You need to be mindful of where the, the media is being consumed. It may not be so relevant these days, but what do you think of that theory? I think that's a good... That's pretty solid i know i have read a lot of short stories on uh, you know bus commutes to and from work and all like i'll I, I usually i wouldn't like finish a short story on the bus one from home to work but i might finish it on the way back so it's helpful to have kind of like logical stopping points just like in a novel but certain short stories are definitely not written that way, with that in mind they're definitely written to be consumed all at once, all in one go. Mm -hmm. um, and it it's just a it's just a question of pacing. I think that was a very astute thing for your professor to say, but it's not always possible. Is what I'm saying. And uh, people read at different rates and at different times and in different contexts anyway. So there's only so much you can really do to anticipate exactly how it's going to go. It's good to be mindful though, yeah. especially if you're writing like a long short story long short stories can borrow a couple of things from a novel like having logical pause points scene breaks for instance mm -hmm. well, i have written some short stories and obviously we can get into the mechanical discussion of how long a short story really is before it becomes a novella mm -hmm. or a novelette or any of these things but i've written some short stories that are 2,000 words, 3,000 words. I've written some short stories that are 20,000 words, which is more of a novel, novella than a, a short story. But like, that's still kind of the format that I used it in. Gotcha. So like every project is a little bit different and it depends a little on the type. If it's a tie-in, those tend to be a little bit longer 
because you don't have to do as much quick work to make everything hit in one particular point because your readers are probably going to have expectations coming into the story and you got to address some of that. You got to put them in the feel of whatever setting you're writing in. Well, let's let's actually wander down that garden path for a few moments. Mm-hmm. What what are some of the major differences between writing a tie-in or an IP short story for Forgotten Realms or Star Wars or Cthulhu or versus something fresh, say for a steampunk anthology. I collect steampunk short stories, so nice. they're all over the place. There's no common IP, but it, it, I just like steampunk. But anyways, yeah, what are the yeah, differences yeah. there? Well, there's a, the most obvious difference, which is that when you're writing a tie-in, it's usually work for hire, and it usually has to be approved by an editor before you write it. Mm-hmm. So you kind of um, like... The per- I don't I don't mean that the editor approves the story before you write the story. I mean the editor approves the pitch and then approves the outline and then approves the story or something like that. But you're not doing it entirely on your own, and you don't have full creative freedom to do it. Also, if you're doing a tie-in, it has to feel like it belongs with other short story tie-ins in that same setting. Like a realm short story has to feel like a realm short story or it's just going to drive the audience out of it, which I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying that it you're making it harder for yourself if you try something really out there and different. And so it has to feel like it's part of part of a set, part of the part of the fall collection of short stories, if you will. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you're doing wholly original, not tie-in short stories, you still have that going on, but you have no way really of telling what the story should feel like. The editor is the one who does that. The editor who acquires the stories and puts them together in a particular set, mm-hmm. right? It's it's what the editor thinks fit together. And you're not going to be able to read all the other stories that people are submitting so you can't necessarily write to that particular fashion. You know, you just have to do your best and get lucky and follow the instructions, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and there's something freeing about that. And there's something, you know, a little bit anxiety producing about that, that you have less guidance, but at the same time, you can go different places. Makes sense. You kind of mentioned it, but I'm curious, when you're writing into an IP, short stories for an IP, existing IP, I would imagine there's kind of a shorthand you can use. There's an established, people already know the world, people already know the mood. If you're writing for Cthulhu, people already know the mythos. So you can kind of focus more on other parts of the creation as opposed to having to do back building stuff. Would that, is that an advantage? Uh, yes and no, I think. Yes, because... You're absolutely correct. There's a certain amount of shorthand and a certain amount of setting knowledge that you can kind of reasonably expect your audience to have. Yeah. But at the same time, not everyone is going to be as experienced with that setting as everyone else reading it. So you still have to put in a little bit of exposition, just maybe not as much. And then the flip side, the double-edged sword, the second edge part of that is that if you get it wrong that's going to throw out a bunch of your audience as well. So writing in an established IP, particularly with very detailed, meticulous, opinionated readers, Mm -hmm. like, shall we say, Star Wars or... uh, We could forgot realms is a bit like that back in the day, not quite like Star Wars, but you know, you know, or Star Trek or one of these other, you know, big, big IPs you really have to do your homework and and do your best to get it right. And you're going to mess up. It, it happens. Um, as long as you're approaching things with full respect and doing your best and doing your due diligence, then you can push all that blame on your editor. So. Wow. <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> just throw them under the bus. Now you're the thing about working in an established IP and a tie in is that your editor is going to be looking for that too. So hopefully between the two of you and anyone else involved in putting the stories together, you'll be able to catch any potential 
hurdles before they become an issue. Nice. I like it. You mentioned pacing, and you've kind of touched on major differences between pacing of short stories and longer narrative fiction, such as scene breaks and, and that. But I'm curious, are there other major pacing considerations? What are the big differences between short stories and novels, for example? Well, so, okay. So if we're going to assume that we're talking about like an, a wholly original, independent short story that you're writing for a themed anthology, a steampunk anthology, mm -hmm. yep. then the pacing is going to be dictated by the story that you're telling. Like, how quickly can you get to this point and how quickly should you get to this point? Because there are some very fast paced, explosive plot, driving plot sort of stories that you can tell in that universe. And there are some slower, comfortable, cozy sort of stories you can tell in that universe. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that has to do with what you're trying to get across in your story, because the, the point is the point is sacred in a, a short story that's that's what we're going to go with and so as long as you're serving that that core point then you're doing your you're doing what needs to be done for the story and don't don't mismatch your pace with your tone right don't make a driving fast-paced cozy story and don't make a slow plotting action-packed story either mm -hmm. you know find think of the experience you want your reader to have and try and bring that through. Nice. I mean, I'm just I'm just curious. Popped into my head mm -hmm. when we're talking about anthology short stories here. Mostly, have you done the whole writ, wrote short stories and send them off to magazines? Like you know, you hear stories about how Stephen King did that as a kid, wrote short stories and send them off to magazines. Have you done that gambit? Oh yeah, definitely. It's it's a bit harrowing. <laughs> Like sometimes I, I will read calls and it's, if it's something that I'm really interested in, or I have a story that is really a perfect fit for it that I haven't published anywhere else, then I will send it in. Often I like to participate mostly in anthologies and such that I'm invited to magazines that I'm invited to because like I get really invested in my work. And if I send it in and they're like, no, 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 we don't want this. I'm like, well, what am I going to do with it? And so I, you know, bury the story with ceremony on my hard drive. And then I write something else because I'm like, well, that was a story that I wrote specifically for that call. And, uh, you know, they didn't take it. So there's nothing that I could do with that story now, is there? Which is a terrible attitude. And no writer should ever appropriate that attitude. Like if you write something, you wrote something. And if it fits in something else down the road, great, go for it, mm -hmm. you know? care about your art my my thing is that like i i have so much to do that i don't frequently seek out other venues the way i used to when i was a lot younger and earlier in my career i did that more often and it was very rewarding i mean you meet some interesting people and make some good connections and you never know who you're gonna come who you're gonna encounter down the road like my i just hired a literary agent for myself for the first time in like a decade right. and I first worked with her when she was the editor of an anthology that I submitted to. And she has edited stuff that I've written before and she became my agent, which is this, the silliest, how did you get agent story ever? It's like, how did you get agented, Eric? Well, my friend of 15 years became an agent and suggested that I submit to her. And now that, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds like some kind of like nepotistic sort of, you know, friends get in the door. No, I still had to go through all the approval process. And I had to convince everybody at the agency because they do everything as a team mm -hmm. that it was still a book they wanted to represent. So it, it's not like I was a shoe in or anything, but still the long game, It. my point is be good to people, make friends, make connections, be nice to people because you never know where people are going to end up. 100% man it's it's uh, <laughs> you can say what you want about it but it really is who you know like I just spent six months doing narrative design training and learning and spending with the video game industry and with game developers and they all say the same thing it's you got to get out and meet people and nobody uses that network word anymore it's just you got to get out and hang out with people make friends get to know folks be yourself and, and offer something to the community like get out and do stuff like mm -hmm. 
it can't just be the work because there's a lot of really talented people out there. So, also to get back to the gaming end of things, mm -hmm. play games with people. Yes, that is such a great way of meeting people and getting over that kind of like awkwardness that you know when you first meet somebody. You know, if you're playing a game and you're working toward a common goal, you can get past some of that stuff. And if it goes well, it goes well. And if it goes bad, it still could go well, right? And you can have this fun story that you can tell. Oh, you remember that time when the ogres just TPK'd our whole party? Oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> you know, we all have lots of those stories. Exactly. Exactly. Um, back to short stories, though. I'm curious, before we move back on to where we're supposed to be, you mentioned the filing cabinet of death, as I call it, the place where short stories and novels and games go to rest. I like to just ask, because I'm an evil, mean son of a bitch, how many stories you got in there? A dozen, probably. That's it? Oh. Yeah. Like like I said, I, I, t I prefer to submit to places that I've been invited to. Nice. And... <sighs> You know, I threw out the number dozen, 12, a dozen, but I haven't really done a count. Like if I actually did a count, I'm worried that I would find that it's a lot more than that. And then I would have this creeping existential dread. So let's go with a dozen yep. as yep. my estimate. <laughs> Fair enough. Like I said, I'm evil. <laughs> That's a good question though. Man, I, I, I know, well, there are some writers who have hundreds of mm -hmm. stories that they've worked on or pieces of stories or concepts that just didn't get just didn't get finished mostly what i have in my cabinet are novels that i didn't publish like i have published 20 novels at this point and i have at least that many novels in my cabinet Holy that God. have just never been published okay, some nice. of them will never be published because they are terrible <laughs> but some of them I'm like, you know what? I could still find a home for this one day. So I'm I guess I'm I guess I'm more in that frame of thinking at the moment. Cool. All right. I'll leave that alone. Oh Speaking man, of... the existential dread is just rising. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Let's move on. Speaking <laughs> of novels, when Eric has a brand new idea, something that's not tied to an IP, something you want to explore and play with. And I've asked this of people when it comes to like game design and, and fiction and stuff, but how would you choose, how would you, how would an idea end up as a short story as opposed to a novel or something else? How do you make that decision? This is a short story. Oh, yeah. There's a certain amount of arcane, intuitive thinking that goes into that. Mm -hmm. It's basically like, so when I, when I think of a story, I tend to think of like particular scenes that I think are really neat, are really striking scenes that I would love to describe and write. And then I ask myself, okay, how much story goes around these scenes to make it so that I can include these scenes? It See, when I describe it that way, it sounds like I'm saying I'm a Zack Snyder sort of writer, but that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I'm saying is that I just, I have very clear visions. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, so let's build out from there. And sometimes I build a lot and I go, okay, I can't do this in a short story. And sometimes I'm like, this is a really cool scene. I started building from it, but I'm not building a lot. And maybe I could just make this a short story because, you know, you just get to this point, boom, this is the core of the story and that's it. Which is not a very scientific answer. I want to be honest, that's like, exactly the answer i expected like i had a follow-up prepared in case, in case you went somewhere else my follow-up was going to be so if you came upon a perfect scene that existed by itself would that become so on oh, same page same excellent page. excellent all right <laughs> so as a short story writer what what are the elements around that scene what are the elements that you think you personally feel because everybody's going to have a different opinion on this what are the elements you feel are essential to a good short story well, I think that there's a lot of overlap with elements that are just essential to any story. Really good, strong sensory description. In a short story, it has to be sharper than in a novel. Because a novel, you can get a gradual build of understanding about the setting and the context of things. But in a short story, you got to be right there, right now, understand what's going on. It doesn't have to be extremely descriptive 
that's not what I mean when I say strong sensory description. Strong sensory description means that you give a couple of details that really put something into your reader's mind. You know, what the steam-powered ship looks like in metaphor. Like, does it look like a particular kind of bird? And if you think of it, if you think of a, a strange kind of bird that it looks like, if you describe it as looking like a heron in stooping for a fish from a small pond, right? That's a that's a very long and large image in just a few short words. Mm -hmm. And then you you don't talk about it just visually. You talk about what it smells like, what the what the steam and smoke coming out of it is like, how the air tastes while you're riding upon this airship, that kind of thing. And you really ground your reader in it. And you have to do that really strongly because you don't have much time to do that. Your story has to be quick and efficient. Even if it's paced kind of gradually, you don't have all that much space to really get that image there. And you want to grab your reader and really pull them in immediately. Good ways to do that are setting up a question or a mystery like you, you describe something strange at the beginning, but you don't fully describe it. So your reader is like, wait, what's going on? What's this strange object that they're carrying? What's this, this word that you use that I don't understand, you know? And, uh, like creating that mystery and asking those questions can be an excellent way to pull someone in just like with the novel, but with a short story, again, you have less time. And then you have to answer those questions. There has to be catharsis at the end of the story. It doesn't necessarily have to wrap up every loose end, but the implication, the, the assumption of a short story is that there's not going to be a follow-up, that it's going to stand on its own. And so leaving loose ends so that you can write a sequel short story doesn't make a whole lot of sense the way it would with a novel. Right. So you got to be willing to cut off those loose ends got to be willing to murder your darlings and you got to be willing to uh, um, make your story serve the core point. I'm curious. In today's digital age with games on our mobile and games on portable devices and, and stories coming at us from all different angles and social media... And then, of course, novels in long form and comic books and, oh, my God. what? Where do you see short stories fitting in moving forward? Is there still a place for them? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Are they going to change into something else? Well, I can't speak for the publishing industry because we, we all know that strange things happen in publishing. Mm. But the format of a short story still persists. Movies, like I said, are basically short stories, slightly expanded short stories in some cases, but still short stories, like they're going toward this one particular point. And so as long as we're watching movies, short stories will still be around. Episodic television is just a, a series of short stories. That's, you know, what The Twilight Zone was originally. That's what Star Trek was and kind of still is, that's what X-Files was, you know? That Monster of the Week stuff. Those are sh horror short stories, or sci-fi short stories, or both, nice. you know? Yeah. And uh, um, The Witcher TV show, the first season was basically several of Sapkowski's short stories from the first, you know, his series started with two anthologies of short stories about these characters, loosely connected primarily by just being in the same setting with the same main character mm -hmm. mostly mostly not always and and then when he started writing the books that were about you know a different character entirely his siri basically becomes the main character of the witcher we're starting to wander down this rabbit hole and my phone is like oh are you talking to me anyway uh, <laughs> but as long as as long as we still have episodic entertainment as long as we still have standalone movies, standalone TV shows, a short the short story form will still have value. Mm -hmm. And short stories are a natural ad adaptation food to bring to an executive because it's a lot easier to ask an executive to read a story rather than read a novel. Yeah. 
much easier to, you know, convert the story into poster boards, storyboards for an executive to look at, actually. And that's easier to do with a short story than with a novel, right? Because yeah. a short story, simpler, straightforward. Well, not necessarily straightforward, but always serving one particular point. Novel can be very expansive. Focus and brevity, like you said. Yep, exactly. We haven't touched on your tabletop role-playing game design chops, and I'm curious, this is completely spinning off into another direction, another rabbit hole. Yeah. One-shots, not full-on modules, but one-shots. What yes. do they bear in resemblance? What's the analog there to a short story? That is a very good analog, and I I think you're right on there. A one-shot, just to be clear for everybody, a one-shot is like a game you would expect to play at a con or as the first time you've played this particular game. These usually will come packaged into any new gaming system or source book. Uh, you know, if you're if you're playing Mothership, for instance, which is sci-fi horror kind of alien slash uh, event horizon sort of game. It'll usually have, I, I think there's like in the core book, there's like an adventure. And then there are a couple of other like one shot adventures that you can purchase and run with people if they're more to your liking. And that is a good way to kind of test out a game system, much like a short story is kind of a good way to test out a writer. It can, it can pull you into that particular voice and that particular tone. The thing is one shots, if they are by different people, can feel very different because, and it, it's not just the flavor text, but it's it's the pacing and the types of challenges that you encounter and how it all flows together. And being a writer and a gamer for long enough, I, I start to see familiar things about adventures that other people are running that I'm in. And I'm like, I think I know who wrote this, or I think I know what company they worked for <laughs> when they wrote this. And, like I, I can see the, I can see some of the stuff from like if somebody is a longtime Pathfinder designer, I can be like, oh, I can see how this, how this would make sense, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that can be really fun too. It's it's like looking at a piece of art and saying, hey, I know the artist who designed this because I can see the uh, the brush strokes. One shot adventures, short stories are all like that. Cool. I agree. Well, buddy, I think we're getting close to the end of the short story stuff, but I do want to ask you before we put short stories to bed and move into the fun stuff before we head out the door. <laughs> you kind of touched on a short story that like left a mark that imprinted. Can you think of a short story that you read or wrote that left a mark on who you are, changed who you are? Like one of those really tent pole moments. Well, so, I mean, the one that I thought of when we were first talking about this was The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. Oh, yeah. Which is, you know, all about this, this kind of like, I, I don't, I don't really want to spoil it, but there's a, it's, it's kind of a utopia short story. Like there's this town and everybody's happy and everything works out, but there's this annual tradition called The Lottery mm -hmm. and it's. It's very moving and it's very surprising, especially if you're not not expecting it. So that's a that's a good one if you haven't if you haven't read that one. I think Neil Gaiman has written a bunch of really good short stories that are really, really effective in that particular vein. I don't remember the titles of them all right now, but there's there's this one about gargoyle. Oh, I didn't and, reach way over there. Hang on. All right, I'll talk about the gargoyle story while while you're reaching. So there's this one in the Fragile Things anthology about this, I, I think it's Fragile Things, about this gargoyle that is forged out of this piece of clay. And it, between this, this man and this woman who are having this very loud, very angry sort of breakup or like pseudo breakup, it's a fight, you know? And there's like all the anger and feelings go into this little thing and it just it does not end the way you expect it <laughs> and i i still remember that one i read that story you know 15 years ago or something and it's still on my mind yeah i'm not gonna look it up there's too many in there He's there are a lot there are a lot stories. he is also a good place to go if you are looking for techniques to absorb in your own short story writing 
Gaiman is a master of short story writing. And it's partly because he comes from comic books, and comic books are essentially short stories themselves. Yeah, we didn't touch on that at all. That's a whole other short story analog there. Right. Sure. And I've never published a comic book, so we're not going to... Well, no, that's, that's, not, that's <laughs> not true. There are there are a couple that, that do have my name in anthologies and stuff, but I am not typically known as a comic book writer, so I won't pretend to be an expert. Oh, but yeah. when I read comic books, they are basically short stories. Extremely efficient short stories especially for like one shots or the most typical comic book build these days seems to be like five issue arc or something and i say these days but really what i mean is like over the last decade and a five issue arc of a comic book is essentially a short story or like maybe a part of a book it's only like a, a novel composed of comic book sort of pacing story would probably be like a trade that has a bunch of comics in it. Gotcha. Like Season of Mists from the Sandman comics would be essentially a novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fair analogy. I like that. Mm -hmm. You're a smart guy. Yeah, uh, sometimes. <laughs> well, my friend, that wraps up, I think, the gist of what I wanted to talk to you about stored stories. Yeah, and great. And you got lots of wisdom there. That's uh, Thank you for sharing that. Efficient. No, no, I was very rambly, and I appreciate you putting up with me. <laughs> you were very focused and brief, and everything a short story is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there is a question I ask everybody, and I think I've asked you it before, but I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you again because I want to see if you have a different answer. Okay. Yeah. This is, it's, been, it's been a year at least, I think. People change, especially creatives. But hey, every day. Yeah. Um, so the question that lives at the core of the podcast, the question that is the heart, the beating heart of my social experiment here is, I have the belief there is a special place at the intersection of story and game, but also comic books, novels, short stories, tabletop role-playing game, board games, all of this stuff, where we can all just get together, hang out, be ourselves, and naturally hang out and get along. If you agree with me, and not everybody does, but if you agree with me, what is the magical thread that holds us all together? So storytelling is a magical thing. Mm -hmm. And when you can see the, the, the passion and energy and just love of the game that goes into it, be it through a tabletop role-playing game, a video game, a comic book, a movie, a short story, a novel, a series of novels, a series of novels that doesn't seem to ever want to end, there's still that heart in it. And I think we can, it's hard to engage with people sometimes on that really emotional level without the, the, the shields, without the barriers between us, because life is hard. Life requires struggle and sacrifice and frustration. That's the dominant, you know, feeling of life is being frustrated because not everything goes the way you want it to. Most things don't go the way you want them to. But when a piece of art gets out there and it's published and you can read it, you can consume it, it's a miracle. You know, it's a certain kind of magic. And the thing is, it's not just you. Anyone can read this. Anyone can experience this. And we can have similar experiences with the same piece of magic but it can mean totally different things to us. So, you know, when we can get together and discuss and talk about these things, then we have a shared, we have something in common immediately, right out of the gate. There doesn't have to be this icebreaker. We don't have to get to know each other for years and years. We already have something that we can talk about. Now, of course, not everyone's good at talking about things. <laughs> Not everyone's good at debating, discussing, or the discourse about any particular work. And, you know, if you go into it with bad faith, that's what you're going to come out of it with as well. But, like, it is, it's a piece of magic that we can, util that we can use to pull people together. I like it. So, nice. yeah. Very cool. You may have asked me that before. I don't remember what I said before, but that's that's how I think of it now. I like it. It sounds like an evolution of your previous answer. Same cool. same core of it, but just a little more matured. Yeah, well, you know, I aged another year. 
Like a fine wine. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's do some quick fire questions and then we'll head out the door. So Great. what are you currently playing? Okay, so I am currently running a 5e game. I am currently guest playing in a West End Games D6 Star Wars game. I am currently playing in a Play Yourself AD&D 2nd Edition Forgotten Realms game, all of which will be broadcast at some point or are being broadcast on the Dungeon Scrawlers. Oh, I'm also playing in another 5e game, so this is four games. I'm playing currently in a Dragon Bane game, which is this, for those who don't know, Dragon Bane is this, is this cool little DD kind of similar sort of game, but not not really out of um, uh, Northern Europe somewhere, I think. I, I don't know the specifics, but it's real fun. And it's like a cross between D&D and Dungeon World, like halfway between those two. Oh, cool. And the character creation is real fast, real fun. And uh, uh, characters are surprisingly, they have surprising staying power for having so few hit points. Anyway, and let's see. And I am playing in another D&D game when we actually meet up that's set in the Iron Kingdom setting, which is pretty fun. That's cool. And that might be it. Was that six, seven? It was a lot. It was a lot. Oh, I'm also I'm also playing my way through Persona 3 Reload, which is the remake of Persona 3, which is a mm-hmm. game I, I just very much love from 15-ish years ago. I just finished my run through of Baldur's Gate 3. I'm going to leave that after like 400, 500 hours of fits and starts and like, oh, I want to play this character. Ah, you know. <laughs> um, and I'm going to leave that for a while before I uh, get back into that. That, cool. that is a really good game that has lots and lots of potential for replayability. All right. All right. What are you currently reading? So I mentioned that I was working on those Dark Sun books, the Prism Pentad. I am rereading those. I am in the middle of rereading Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which is an mm-hmm. excellent novel, harrowing. I read it initially when it kind of first came out in the early 90s, and I was like, no. This is preposterous. This is just terribly, terribly terrible about the future. And I read it now and I'm like, "Eh, you know, it's just uh, climate change is a thing, is what I'm saying. I am also in the middle of Delilah Dawson's Rise of the Red Blade Star Wars novel, which is fantastic, highly recommended. I like bad guys in Star Wars. What can I say? And yeah, I think that, I think that's it. Just the three. Uh, yeah, I don't know when you sleep. Um, <laughs> okay. No, no um, answer. <laughs> this is kind of a newer question I added to my quick fire stuff. If your essence could be perfectly boiled down and translated into a tabletop role playing game, what race and class would you be? Oh, wow. Well, in my Isekai Realms game, where we are playing ourselves sucked into the Forgotten yeah, Realms, you got a shortcut. I am playing a human paladin. I used to be an aspiring paladin, but now I am an actual paladin because we finally found someone to give us training because the 2E rules are terrible <laughs> as regards leveling up. But, you know, I also like I like tieflings a lot, and I, I don't think I'm 100% paladin. I'm struggling with being lawful good because the rule set we're using is second edition D and D and you have to be lawful good to be a paladin. Yeah. I am not lawful good as a normal person. I am a neutral good person, I think. So I I'm struggling with that in the game and I, I brought that into the story. So it's fun. Also I, I run around initially just hacking down enemies and I'm like, die NPCs. And, and one of my other players was like, don't do that. Those are people. And I'm like, what? And then I had an existential crisis that lasted like three episodes where I was like, oh no, they are people. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good game. It's a, it's a good time. Anyway, so yeah, let's go with uh, let's go with human paladin, maybe a couple of rogue levels. Nice. Okay. I think I've asked you this one before. Have I ever asked you about the home the game session with four people? No? Okay. We're gonna I don't do think it. think so. Okay. So last one. If you could host a game session with any four people living or dead from any time in history, who would it be and what would you play? Oh, man, that's so good. Such a good question. Oh, my God. This is not a rapid fire question. I need to think (laughs) about this one. Okay, so my uh, (laughs) so the 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 kind of personal warm hearted answer to this question is my original high school D&D group, which was 
four people plus me. And then we had other like guest players who played for a while. So we really had five for most of the time, but like there were four permanent ones. And we are, that is one of the games that I'm currently playing. That's the Iron Kingdoms D&D game. And I am playing an elven, an elf ranger, which is mechanically suboptimal, but I'm having a good time. So, you know, that is what it is. And then the, the more like, I am a professional game or a gamer slash author response would be that I would have Ed Greenwood at the table who I have played with. I played with yesterday, actually. Uh, he, is, he is an amazing player or DM and would just bring a lot to any particular game. Um, I would have Neil Gaiman, who is still my favorite author and has been for two decades now. Um, and I would have, I, w- I would invite Christy Golden, who was an author from back in the day. And she's, well, I mean, she's been a very consistent, consistently published sci-fi fantasy author for as long as I've been alive. Uh, like she started writing when I was very young and mm-hmm. that's when I first discovered her and I've read lots of her books and I think she would be amazing. And my fourth player would probably be B. Dave Walters, who is just the most amazing of men. And he is one of the few people who I collaborate with and work with who is taller than me. I am 6'7", and he's 6'9", and it's remarkable. So that would be my my dream team. Nice. That I would love to watch that. Oh, it would be it- great. My first memory of Eric's got to be was at Gen Con, my first Gen Con. I'm like looking around. I'm used, I can normally see over top of everybody because I'm also a very tall person. And then it's like, who the hell is that? Yeah, his head is above everybody's. <laughs> and I'm looking around like, where'd everybody go? <laughs> you made me feel short and I don't feel short. Very. <laughs> I think we were separated at birth or something. Neil Gaiman's been my favorite author like forever. And then Christy Golden... For also forever the the narrative course I took she's actually alumni so I got to chat with oh, her yeah awesome she's yeah, so cool very cool all right man great answer so before we head out the door I do like to open up a space here at the end for you to talk about anything that you're working on have worked on in the past what do you want to boost public enemy perhaps what else yeah you so so there's this there's this thing behind me I'll just move my head out of the way <laughs> so Public Enemy is the second in my Justice Vengeance series of superhero novels and uh, you know it's it's a modern take on superheroes it's a little bit of the modern cynicism but like they're still superheroes and they're just kind of like trying to deal with uh, social media and public life and in a, in a very modern context and uh, like I have one character who is a, a jaded Gen Xer, and then these two kids running around who are very, very, very young millennial slash uh, Zoomers, and, uh, <laughs> and the um, the generational conflicts between the characters is really interesting, and like how their powers bleed into their lives and affect them. We talked about this guy, Marcus Orestes, on the last time we talked, I think. He has energy manipulation powers. The easiest for him to wield is lightning. I don't want to suggest that lightning is his thing, but like lightning is the easiest one for him to manipulate because it manifests on its own from his anxiety disorder. And when he gets anxious, energy kind of leaks out of him and causes disruption to everything all around. And so part of his journey in learning to control his powers is also about dealing with his own anxiety, which is a thing that I've dealt with in my own life. And many of us have, you know, anxiety is a very common, very understandable bit to deal with, right? It is terrible and it can really, you know, slow you down and and hamper your life in so many ways. And part of writing this is to show that you know, you can find ways through it and you're not going to find a cure for it. A cure doesn't exist, but you can find ways to handle it and deal with it. Also meds, meds can be a good thing. So, you know, if you 
or, or any of anyone listening to the sound of my voice has you feel anxious or you feel run down, you know, talk to somebody about it. They can they can really help and point you in the right direction. Right on. So I have read the first book in that series and the other stuff that came out with the Kickstarter, I backed all that. Fantastic. It's compelling. It's fun as hell. Like it's it's good time. So yep. I'm check it. I'm dead. current. Awesome. I'm currently writing book three, which is Fallen Angel. It's about a girl who is kind of a modern day Shakira Twitter celebrity superhero. And she all right, she's kind of defined partly by her fear of isolation and being alone. And she has to kind of like work by herself to help some people out of a really desperate situation in the novel. And it's 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 really fun. I should mention a few other things. Oh, yes. Blind Justice, our um, <clears throat> public enemy, is coming out this summer. I don't know exactly when this is going to broadcast, but I think June is when the book comes out. So I'll uh, look for it from DEF CON 1 Publishing. Right. As we mentioned, I am also one of the founding members and regular streamers on the Dungeon Scrawlers actual play channel. Mm -hmm. uh, our gimmick is that we are writers and we have expanded it to game designers and visual artists as well, running games and uh, characters. And it makes for some really cool situations. I mean, we're not really any different from gamers of any background, right? But like... As writers, we tend to have strong opinions about mm -hmm. character arcs and like where our characters should be going. And it it creates some very cool tension, some very cool storytelling. And I highly recommend it. We just recently finished up a an adventure, a campaign called Fearful Symmetry, which was kind of a spin-off of the original Westgate Irregulars campaign that I ran as a DM. Fearful Symmetry is run by Aaron Evans, who is an amazing author. Um her books are her most recent book is relics of ruin came out really recently it's set in this totally original very meticulously built fantasy world because it's aaron evans that's what she does mm -hmm. um and it's a <laughs> how does she describe it i think it was a murder mystery with cute librarians or something it was <laughs> it was very cool and an epic fantasy yeah, I highly recommend it. Anyway, she runs the Fearful Symmetry game, and that just recently finished. And it took those original characters and led them to a pretty epic, good end point, I think. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they won't show up again, but like, it seems like a very fitting swan song for those characters. And that was that was pretty great. Again, like I said, I recently hired a new editor, and she and we are currently sending out my first book that I wrote for her with on submission. I think today it's going to go out or something. Nice. Today, time of recording, yeah, which is late April. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. I'm optimistic. I think the book turned out really well. I'm excited to see what people think of it. So yeah, that's that's basically where I am. I'm excited to get my hands on the book, and. Tell Aaron she did an incredible, like your, the original one was fantastic. I loved Irregulars, but she did a great job. So that, I, I tell her that repeatedly, but I will tell her that you said so. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So that's everything you're working on and everything people should check out. And as always, I will have links in, in the bio below for people to, to find your stuff. So awesome. Awesome. With all of that being said, it's time to head out the door. I would like to give you the final word. Do you have a parting word of wisdom you'd like to drop on us? So in any story you're telling, especially a short story or a one-shot adventure, remember that the point is sacred. That your story is, it has a central point and you need to honor that in your story and it will all hang together. Keep working, you got this. Well, the rating party calls and I must answer, so that's the end of another episode. Before we close up shop and push everybody out the door, I want to say thank you to Eric for sitting down and sharing your wisdom and insight into the art of storytelling. And as always, to you, dear listener, thank you for sitting down and taking your spot at the table. Until we meet again, may you continue creating, exploring, and sharing your stories with the world. Stay safe out there, Wanderer. Your chair will be ready by the fire the next time you stop in at the corner of story and game.